Hey, it's Mark Podolsky, The Land Geek, with your favorite niche real estate website, thelandgeek.com. And on this week's Roundtable podcast, we have almost all the usual suspects, but we have a special guest. Our guest today is Yaro Starak. Now, if you're not familiar with Yaro, he's the co-founder of InboxDone.com, an email management company with a team of 25 plus uh, serving clients, including restaurant owners, venture capitalists, accountants, doctors, lawyers, real estate agents, car retailers, online coaches, and many more. Yaro has made 30 plus angel investments in tech startups, including Steezy, Lead IQ, Fluid Forever, Fitbot, and NutriSense. It's property investments in Canada and Ukraine in a partnership built a 3.6 million watt solar farm. During the mid 2000s, Yaro sold his first company, betteredit.com, then built an online education company, blogmastermind.com, selling over $2 million of his books and online courses. Yaro has been featured in Forbes, Entrepreneur Magazine, Huffington Post, Founder, Pro Blogger, Social Media Marketing World, Upwork, and hundreds of media outlets and events. He's finally on something prestigious, our <laughs> podcast. Yaro, welcome. Uh, thanks, Mark. I, I got to. Uh, shrink down that intro is it's little too many things going on at once i think but i appreciate you saying everything i i i i really respect you know the entrepreneurial add but it's great it's great so y'all um how did you get started as an online entrepreneur uh a, a bit of luck and and the desire to avoid having a job, that was probably the, the primary thing, just looking to avoid bosses and alarm clocks and uh, having a cap on how much money I can make with, you know, an hourly rate. So I wanted to, you know, control my own income. I wasn't sure how, uh, but I did sort of read some books and realized entrepreneurship seemed to be the only path unless you're like born into money somehow. Um, and then it was luck because I was turning 18 in 1998. And if any of the, the older people here can remember, that was the dot-com bubble kind of happening and the, the first uh, sort of rise of the internet. So it was perfect timing. I was trying to figure out what to do with my life and the internet was trying to figure out what to do with itself. And uh, I got naturally kind of fell in love with the internet and you know built my own website. And that kind of kickstarted the whole, the whole career of, of online business. Very, very cool. So uh, I'm going to hand off the next question to Dude Buddy, the nightcap OG, Scott Bossman. Scott, what question do you have for entrepreneurial superstar, Yaro Starak? Sure, Yaro. Nice to, nice to meet you. Thanks for being here. Um, so I guess uh, it sounds to me like you uh, do a lot of different things. And I mean, you're, you're a successful coach. You have a lot of different businesses. So, so how do you run all of those things uh, concordantly with, without getting burnt out? Uh, how, how, how are you able to manage all that? Yeah, it's a good question, Scott. Uh, you know, you have to kind of go back in time. I, I was like most entrepreneurs doing anything and everything to start with and kind of getting nowhere with, with a lot of ideas and then realized with some failing and studying that I had to kind of focus on something that was working. And this is like in my early twenties and in early two thousands. And at that point, yeah, I kind of discovered, okay, a business is working. Let's double down and do some more. And then let's take this as far as you want to take it, hopefully, you know, to a, a good financial result. Um, and then I really went deep in one business actually for a long time, my, my coaching business, which was sort of 2005 to 2015, um, I had good focus then. I was writing a blog, writing a newsletter, doing a podcast, um, selling courses. Uh, and, and, you know, I had some a few things here and there with investing on the side, property and so on. But mostly I was focused on that business. And then I transitioned, which I, I think it's funny at the time, I didn't see this happening. But, you know, as an entrepreneur and an investor, you always want to kind of do lots of things at once. And in order to realize that, two things have to happen. I had to build a team and I had to have some kind of capital build up to do investments as well. So uh, what kind of naturally happened is being in business for long enough, I did build up some capital and that's how I did things like angel investing and um, invested in property, invested in crypto. And with some of the winnings there, I, I built that solar farm you mentioned at the start. But to be absolutely honest, the real reason I could do um, multiple projects is the fact that one, my my kind of main company at the moment, Inbox Done, I have a co-founder, 
we have a management team, you know, we have a, a team of actually 40 uh, contractors now working on that company. And, you know, I have a very defined role. I'm, I'm sort of chief marketing officer and I've set up some marketing campaigns for the company, but the day-to-day operations, I don't do, um, you know, I, I speak to my co-founder once every two weeks, but for the majority of the time, she's running the business while I'm sort of just evangelizing the business mostly. Um, well, and while that's happening, you know, my coach coaching business has systems in place. It's got email automation. It's it's based on content marketing, so it gets traffic organically. Um, it's got a built up reputation. In fact, Mark probably only knows me because I had a blog, you know, ten plus years ago, uh, doing all of that. So it's a combination of people systems, content systems, and just building up capital to make investments. Is the is the short answer to your question? No, it's great. And I think the land business is, is very similar. Uh, people systems, capital systems, um, you know, automated systems and that type of thing. So, no, I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Y- Yaro, you're you're like as ambitiously lazy as all of us, <laughs> which which is fantastic. So um, I'm going to hand off the, the mic to Eric, the technician Peterson. Eric, what's your question? Yaro, good to meet you. Happy to have you on the podcast today. Um, I want to continue the discussion around systems. So, um, you know, we can build systems for all different aspects of, of a business, but, you know, what specifically kind of systems did you put in place that allowed your businesses to grow without you? Well, the again, there's been phases to systems for me. I, I think the the first system I ever built would have been an email autoresponder. Um, it, it's maybe too simple an answer nowadays, but I remember the first time I discovered this uh, tool where you could have an email get sent out once a week on autopilot and you don't have to be there. So I, I went a little crazy with it. I ended up writing a, a newsletter for about 50 weeks, so almost a year's worth of weekly newsletters. But I set it up so that I write, wrote the newsletter and someone who joined my email newsletter would start at the beginning. And then they'd go through all 50 of those weekly editions over a year. So when I finished writing it, I then had new people join and they had a year's worth of content to get through. And what was amazing to me, and this still is amazing to me really, that, that people would start buying my stuff from all these emails I'd written previously. And I, I wasn't actively doing anything to keep that newsletter going. It was just this autopilot trip release of content. And that was sort of the first introduction to me of the power of the internet, email responders, content marketing, content, you know, using content to sell, uh, build trust, educate, do all those things, but do it once and then set it up so it keeps going on autopilot. So it was funny when I um, first discovered that, I remember there was that cliche of making money while you sleep. And like a lot of people, I thought that was a scam and, you know, it's not really possible. Um, and then I, I remember waking up a few mornings, I had made a sale and then, you know, there'd be some money sitting in my bank account because someone had read email number 32 in the email sequence. And that was the moment they decided to buy something. And I was like, whoa, I just made money while I sleep. Maybe it's not quite as big a scam as it was. Um, and thanks to technology. And then fast forward, obviously, from there, there's so many other forms of automation. That was my introduction. But then you know, I learned about the the power of simple transaction automation, like offering an upsell and a downsell. Um, I learned about uh, just the power of you know other forms of uh, marketing automation. You can you know drip release social media content, um, and then taking away the technology side, but tapping into more of the the human side, which sometimes you know you need for more creative tasks. So um, using people to go from you know out tasking one little thing to completely creating an entire business so i remember um not really in automation so much but i was struggling with creating product and i realized why am i spending so much time creating slides for a powerpoint presentation which would then turn into a video and that was a product when i could just get someone to create the slides for me i would read out an audio they would turn into a video and away it went um and that kind of you know unlock this idea that, well, there's services that could be delivered through people as well. So that actually was kind of not the dawn of my current company inbox done, but the principle was there. It's like, you can build a team, you can deliver services to other people, and you can basically be one cog in a machine that's run by human beings as, as well as technology. So 
I mean, I could dive into so many different little automations that are going along with my business, but it's all thanks to technology and, and humans. And of course, me picking the one thing that I'm good at and focusing my energy there, which you know has been content creation. Sometimes it's just partnering with the right people. Sometimes it's raw sales, like being on a sales call, but there's usually one or two core things that I focus on because I enjoy it, but also it's an important you know cog in the machine. That's great. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. I love it when you call me Big Papa, Tate Litchfield. What's your question for Yaro? Yaro, nice to meet you. Thanks for coming on. Uh, we appreciate it. So you've accomplished a lot. What keeps you motivated? I mean, at the end of the day, you've done enough as an entrepreneur in the last you know, 20, 30 years that most people would call it quits. And here you are on our podcast. What keeps you motivated? <laughs> Uh, well, Tate, I, I have to ask then, well, what else do you do, right? Like, what do you spend your time doing? I, I learned a long time ago that you know, sitting on the beach is, is fun for a weekend or a week, but you don't want to spend your entire time just uh, cruising around. I mean, I'm a digital nomad in the sense that I do like to travel and I like to see uh -huh. new things. But, you know, if you're not building something or solving a problem, um, ultimately helping other people in some shape or form, it is kind of hard to, you know, get out of the bed and be excited about the day, I think. So um, yeah. I, I've been conscious of, Avoiding the treadmill, which I think a lot of entrepreneurs can get on where a combination of maybe comparing yourself to someone else and I was wanting more and there's always going to be someone to compare yourself and there's always going to be more, which you know, nothing wrong with that. But if that's detrimental to your happiness and your health, then you got to be careful about that treadmill. At the same time, it's nice to have a goal. It's nice to be motivated to improve something, build something, change something. So, um, or even just to see your ideas executed. I think that's one of the biggest things for me is I like to see something that could help other people that could have a business model behind it. Um, I, I, I love making money too. And that, that's always something I think we all enjoy. So, you know, I, I keep working towards that as well. Um, but it changes. I think that's the, the great thing about entrepreneurship is you have the power to evolve into different business models, different ideas. Um, you can experiment, you can do multiple things at once once you start building up resources and you know uh, build teams and everything we're talking about here. And, and that's lovely because I remember when I was younger, I kind of wanted everything. I wanted to be you know invested here, um, growing one company here, owning another company there. Uh, Richard Branson is partially to blame for that. As we, you know, everyone who's grew up hearing about Richard, it's like he owns the, this company and you know, this company. He's having fun all the time and doing promotions for things. So there was definitely some influence uh, on on him uh, on me. But um, ultimately, it's it's just a freedom uh, to choose what you want to do. I think that's the, the best you know reason to keep going. That resonates well with uh, I think. I know me, I know Mark and everybody else on this podcast, but a lot of our listeners too, because at the end of the day, that's that's all we really want is the money's great. But I think every single one of us and you agree is after time, right? That's that's the one thing that we can't have enough of. And so that freedom to spend your time however you want or watching TV or sitting on the beach or working, that's really the key is that is that freedom. So thank you. I appreciate that. You have to tell us more about your digital nomad lifestyle here in a second. Well, I, I want to hear about the digital nomad lifestyle for sure. But Yaro, I I have two problems um, that I think you can help me with. So you know the story of Sisyphus, the uh, the Greek, uh, you know, guy that was he angered the gods and he had to keep he was like you know he had to keep putting pushing a boulder up the hill, and just when he got to the top, the boulder comes down. Right. That's my first story. My second story is, you know, Tate lives in Las Vegas and that whole city is built on random reward, right? This hope we're going to go and maybe we'll get, you know, random, like a reward. It's a it's sort of an addiction. I've just described to you my entire email life. It feels to me like, as soon as I get to inbox zero, that boulder comes down and ding, another <laughs> email comes in. That being said, I love checking email obsessively. Did I get a good email? Oh, I got a bad email. Now they want me to do this. Did I get a good email? Oh, now I got a bad. So it's, I'm, I'm constantly checking for that random reward. 
can you help me with these two problems? Uh, yeah, I, I love the, the analogy or the, the story there, Mark. I, I, I think about this myself sometimes whenever I'm washing dishes and I go, you wash the dishes, you make the dishes dirty. You wash the dishes again, you make them dirty. And it's like, and it never ends. It's not like you're going to one day stop having to, even if you have a dishwasher, you still have to put them in there, unpack them. You know, it's never, never ending. Um, and that's like email. You're quite right. It's it's one of those things, unless you decide to just opt out of email completely, there, there's, you just can't get out of it. Um, and on the flip side, there's a lot of things you like about email too. I'm the same. I, I've been so excited, uh, hopefully on a daily basis, seeing a, a sale notification coming in to my inbox. So I'm addicted to that thrill as well. Um, but I learned a long time ago that in kind of the theme of this part, what we're talking about today is this idea of making smart use of your time. And email is a good example of a mix of very few things that are important and, and are smart use of your time and a whole lot of things that are not. And because of that, I realized in order to break free from the amount of time that email requires from you, you have to start handing over the parts of your email or maybe even the majority, if not all of it, that are not a high use of your time. So um, I mentioned earlier in this podcast I was getting started sort of in the dot-com boom era. And then straight after that ended, I actually had my first kind of real company that I call it. It was uh, an online essay editing business. And it was very simple. I had um, contract academic editors and I had international students writing papers who were struggling with English because it's not their first language. And they would often submit papers for editing and proofreading uh, on a very last minute basis. Now we were smart. We charged a higher editing fee if the turnaround time was a, a short amount of hours. So if you know they submit a paper at 9 p.m., I need it back 9 a.m. the next day, we charge double the rate to try and do a rush job. Um, great business model, but unfortunately it meant that I had to check my email constantly in case a rush job would come in late or you know I have to confirm with the editor, can you do it in time, collect the money and so on. And I found myself just trapped to the inbox. So that business forced me to go, I, if I want freedom, I have to de delegate, outsource this inbox to someone else. And that was the first time I ever did it. Um, back then, no one talked about outsourcing email. It just wasn't done. Um, but I, I ended up uh, working with a, a friend of mine who was a stay-at-home mom, just their first baby. I said, listen, I want to see if you can take over 100% of my email and do everything I do. And, and I was worried because... Uh, I was worried she would not write the right replies. She would lose potential sales, you know, all the potential issues with someone actually replying to your emails. But we did a very careful sort of month-long journey together where I taught her everything about the email, how to reply about my company. And, you know, within two to three months, she was fully fluent in doing email, if as good as me, if not better. Um, and that was the seed of the business I run today. I didn't actually start the business till like a decade after that first experience of, of outsourcing and delegating email. But I always knew in the back of my head, this is something entrepreneurs really need. They want to break free from the inbox. It's a big time suck. Uh, so we started Inbox Done to do that. And it's been really interesting because we have, like you mentioned in my intro, such a variety of, of clients from uh, vegan bakery to Caribbean marriage celebrant to used car salesperson to a traditional lawyer, doctor, dentist, online coach. And everyone has email and everyone spends too much time in there and they feel trapped to it. And like you said, it's the rock you keep pushing up the hill and then it falls back down again because new emails arrive. And then when you open their eyes to this idea of someone else being the person in there and they're only showing up to do the two to 5% of emails that really matter to them. And maybe they do them once a week. I actually do it once a month. I have a Yarrow folder. I go in there once a month and deal with the few emails that are for me. I'm um, obviously emergencies I've, I'm told about by my team, but 95% of my email is handled by someone else. And once you do that, it's kind of like flying first class because you, you no longer have this responsibility and it's actually tough if someone says you're back in charge of your email, you're like, I don't think I ever want to go back in there. You know, I don't want to look at my inbox ever again. So, um, and that's what I do. I, I spread the gospel now of breaking free from email. Hence I'm here talking to you guys. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But yo, how do I break the addiction? The addiction? I, yeah. Because like you said, like there's some emails I do like getting, would I just get them? once a day like oh mark at four o'clock here's your random reward yeah <laughs> is that well 
let me let me ask you, Mark. What are you addicted to? Do you, do you just do you want to see the sales emails? Do you want to get the feeling of hitting the reply button and getting it to zero? What parts are you addicted to? I mean, I don't have that much self awareness. I would say okay. that um, if you're putting me on the spot, I would say that part of it is um, did I did did I get a sale? Um, and then part of it is, you know. Is there something like, like, do I need to respond to a client or a, a coaching client or just seeing what's going on with a coaching client that I may or may not have to respond to? This is this overall feeling of, of watching everything. And to your point, 95% of it, I do not need to see. And I'll be working and then all of a sudden, like, I'll get that, that feeling, oh, wait. Did I miss something? Maybe I should check an email. Or it might just be even if I'm you know, anxious. Uh, let's for, say, for example, um, I'm going to have a difficult conversation with Taria. And then, oh, wait, before I have that co- difficult conversation, I feel anxious. I'll go check email. Right? I can sort of offload it. I, I'd say that is, is the way it was, sort of works for me. It's, you know, like, like an addict. Yeah. Okay. Well, first thing, we're going to sign you up with some therapy. That's going to be the, the starting point to, <laughs> to break three. <laughs> but um, you know, jokes aside, if it's an addiction, uh, like all addictions, first thing is acknowledging that it is an addiction and then treating it like one. Uh, you know, uh, acknowledging the emotions you're looking to fulfill there and and why you're trying to get them from email. Because um, at the end of the day, you can get all the benefits of seeing a sale without actually being the one answering your emails. Like what I did is I handed over all my email to a person and it kind of ended up being the best of both worlds. Cause I still have it on my phone and I would still be able to see notifications if I wanted to. And I would then look and see a sale. So I get a sugar rush, you know, for that moment, the endorphins would hit, Oh, I made money. Great. And then if I got another email that says, I want a refund or your product sucks or whatever, I'd be like, oh, that hurts. But I don't have to be the one who now has to do damage control in this situation because I know my email assistant, that's their job. So it's kind of like, this is great. I now shielded from the things I didn't like about email. I can still look and get the hit for whatever parts of the email I want to get a hit for. Um, and then I also kind of had to train myself though to realize this is not important. And maybe I shouldn't have the notifications on my phone. You know, maybe I should only check in once a day and just look at things without replying to things. And, and we, we treat, treat our clients like this too. We're saying you have to train yourself to change a habit here. This is not simply delegating. This is actually habit changing as well. So if that's the case, first of all, we want to make sure you're comfortable with the idea of someone replying to your emails for you. Then we want you to be comfortable with it actually happening. So we have a very careful handover process where you see the emails we write as drafts, you give feedback, you know, you give our changes, we go through an approval process. And we do that for as long as it takes to reach the point where you say, you know, the way you're writing these emails, I'm happy with it. I don't need to be part of a draft approval process anymore. And then the last phase is really the habit breaking. And it becomes easier to break a habit when you start seeing the sent folder and looking at the replies that your assistants are writing for you and going, huh, that's actually as good or sometimes better than what I would have written in that situation because it's their job. They have time to write a longer reply. They build systems and templates and rules and structures and they can you know, complete other processes around the email because that's what used to frustrate me about email is great. I made a sale, but then, oh, I got to update some software. I got to send a welcome email. I've got to, you know, let let the accountant know about something. There were all these tasks that would be generated by it that aren't always fun. So by handing over email and then handing over the tasks that come with those emails to an assistant, it was so much time freeing. And, um, you know, now I'm, I'm the opposite. I, I can't imagine wanting to be the person in the inbox, but I certainly am happy to get the sugar rush from the sales or, you know, whatever comes in that is good uh, in, in the inbox, but I'm very happy to not have to deal with all the bad things in the inbox too. So, you know, the, I'm sure all of you guys, guys and girls know when you get an email from someone who, you know, they're, they're 
trying to figure out how to do something within your company and they're missing the obvious and they're and you're like there's just a button you need to click or just follow the instructions on the page but instead they just keep writing you these emails with you know all over the place questions knowing that that's not my job to be patient and carefully handle that person is a huge relief because i i had like i was running out of patience uh, with a lot of emails so i think that that's a massive benefit in, in my mind i i love it i i think this might be one of the greatest luxuries of, of all time now in our, in our modern era, if you know, and I don't even want the, I, I honestly don't even want the sugar off. Like Taria tell you, I, I, I quit sugar and then, and I feel great when I don't eat sugar, but then I, I go back on it because, you know, you have an I, addictive personality by the time. I, of I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, before we get to tip of the week, I do want to give Tria putting in the reps, Harris, her opportunity to ask you, uh, another question, Taria. Hey there, and my apologies for uh, showing up late. Uh, I was reading some of your bios and, and I don't know what question you've already answered. So forgive me if this is something you've already covered. Um, but I noticed in one of them, you talked about um, despite your success, you reach burnout. Um, and a part of it was because something wasn't structured kind of properly in your environment. Was that already covered? <laughs> Not oh, so okay. Much, no. <laughs> okay. So my question is because sometimes it gets, it, it gets a little bit tough. Like if systems aren't done correctly, then you can reach burnout, but then there are also times where maybe in your situation as well, it was, it was systems, but then your passion and your love for that particular type of work also waned. So can you talk a little bit about how you manage, like making sure systems are in place and determining when it's time to pivot? Is it a system pivot? Is it, I just don't have the love for it, so I need to delegate this task to someone else. But how do you manage both the process side and kind of your emotional side? Right, yeah, big questions there. The The pivot question is, is always hard. There's no black and white answer for that. Um, I would like to sort of address the idea of burnout first, though. Uh, I've never considered myself burnt out on any kind of business or project, but I certainly have considered myself lacking motivation to do the things I knew was necessary to take it to the next level. And that to me is more of an issue of alignment with what you're doing and the goal and where you're heading with it. That's certainly been the case for me. Um, I've been excited like that essay editing company I talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. I was loving growing that because it was the first company I made that made a full-time income for me. You know, I was 21, 22, 23, trying to make enough money to pay my rent, move out of my you know parents' house and so on. And I got that far. I, I moved out. I, you know, was making back then it was like 35 grand a year. It was full-time income, not probably not quite enough nowadays, but it was, you know, 25 years ago. And that was huge. And I was super motivated to get there just to break free. But then once I reached that point, I was like, wow, man, I don't want to keep doing the next level steps to grow this further. Because frankly, I just don't like selling proofreading and editing services. It's just a really boring subject to me. Um, I, I wasn't motivated to you know, build a team around it. The profit margins were, were making it difficult. It wasn't a rapid high growth company. It was just a steady you know, company. So that kind of, I wouldn't call it burnout, but certainly it was the case of, I don't want to do the things necessary. So I wanted to not just pivot, I wanted to completely leave or, you know, that's why I started blogging and coaching and teaching, not uh, uh, to break free from the essay editing company, but because it was something I was more excited to experiment with just to see what happened. Luckily, that turned out to be a pathway to another business, you know, an online coaching and teaching business. Uh, and then I was able to sell and exit out of the essay editing company too. So, you know, I, I look to what you're trying to do, what's the immediate goal versus the long-term goal. And that can very much dictate your motivation. Uh, I think burnout happens when you keep doing something you don't want to do, do that for long enough, then you're clearly going to burn out. And, you know, then you're not going to, you're just going to be done. You're going to have to stop completely. It's kind of like pushing yourself when you're sick, eventually you just can't do it any further. So, uh, but to, to then connect that with the idea of pivoting and knowing when to, this is difficult because there's sometimes very clear reasons to pivot. Like, you're just not getting traction. If you're not making sales and you feel like you've really put in the effort to reach audiences, to put an offer in front of people, um, you feel like you've done copywriting well, you've done, you reached enough people, you've got an offer that 
you thought was appealing, but it's it's not selling, um, then yeah, then you you, you got to change your offer, change your market, change your business model. Something has to change. The real tricky part is when you've got something that might be working okay. Like actually my essay editing company was a good example. It was working okay, but I wasn't going to get rich from it. I wasn't loving the process. And I didn't know whether there was a path to, you know, doubling, tripling, quadrupling the business in, in a way that I was excited to, to do. And that's why I ended up kind of leaving that company. So, uh, but it is tricky because when something is working well, in fact, my current company is an example of that where we've got like, five years now of it being my main project. And there were a couple of years in there where we were kind of stagnant with where we were going. And I was putting in a lot of effort. I thought the offer was great. Who doesn't want email management services? Every time I talk about it, everyone goes, this sounds great. I want to get rid of my email too. But then you go through these lulls where you just, you know, you're not reaching enough of the right target customer. You may be, you know, getting sort of stagnant growth, maybe slow growth when you want it to be rapid growth. And you're like, what's going on? But then in this case, I kind of went, you know what? I just think I need to try a couple of different angles, repositioning the homepage, tapping into some new marketing channels. And lo and behold, 12 months later, you know, we've tripled in size. And I'm like, okay, thank God I didn't give up on that one. Uh, instead, I kind of doubled down and, and pushed through and did some more experiments. But that was because I was still excited to sell the, the value proposition of the company. I was I wanted to talk about email management and, and this idea. So you know, a lot of it's personal to the entrepreneur. Some of it's situational to the marketplace. Sometimes it's the stage of an industry or the business or your life. You know, there's so many different things there that can influence this. I think it's always important to ask all those questions. Of why are you thinking about giving up? Why do you feel burnt out? What is it you don't have that you want and why are you not getting it from your current project? Uh, and then start to answer the real practical questions of do you need to pivot and what does that look like? New business, new product offer, uh, you know, step to the left, step to the right, or completely giving this up and starting something new. You know, that, that's, that's, a, that's a big question to ask yourself. Thank you. I appreciate it. That was very thorough. All right, y'all. This has been fantastic and your mentorship has been invaluable but we're now at the time of the podcast where we're going to ask you for your tip of the week a website a resource a book something else actionable for the art of passive income listeners to go improve their businesses improve their lives but before you do that i gotta give a shout out to our sponsor which is flight school learn how the next 16 weeks can literally transform your life go up the mountain of land investing quickly safely and efficiently with scott todd who has done it thousands of times as your Sherpa. Oh, by the way, that uh, that investment ain't going to cost you nothing. Guaranteed. You're going to make it back 180 days or less. Just show us your work. Learn more. Go to thelandgeek.com forward slash training. Thelandgeek.com forward slash training. All right, Yarl, what is your tip of the week? I'm going to tie this into exactly what we talked about. If you're not doing it already, Get yourself an email autoresponder. And I can mention plenty. There's options out there. ConvertKit, AWeber, ActiveCampaign, MailChimp. There's so many. They all do the same thing. They all allow you to set up an email newsletter or email sequence, a, a drip release of email content. If you've never done it before, just set up anything. Even if it's like one week, two weeks, three weeks, uh, you could do a, go crazy like me and, and do a year's worth of content. But just do it to experience the automation and the power of email marketing with automation because there's nothing I've experienced like it. And it is so simple to get it up and running. And, uh, you know, you can have something that's you build in a month and then for the next two or three years continues to deliver value as new people discover that email sequence. I ended up building like 20 different sequences over the years as a coach. And I've always been blown away when a sale would come in and it was because someone read an email that I wrote, you know, even 10 years ago. And that's something you can set up today. It's easy, it's low cost and uh, very effective. All right. Well, I thought that's a, a pretty good tip. Tate, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, it's it's an essential piece of the, the par project for when you're an entrepreneur is you got to have some sort of automation. And he's right. There's nothing better than just seeing it happen and not doing anything. And it's addictive for sure. Yeah, no, and it's a good tip, but it's not a great tip because my tip of the week is life-changing. Go to inboxdone.com. And it's amazing what this uh, service will do for you. Inbox Zero every day. Schedule your calendar 
We guard your time, handle confirmations, rescheduling. We didn't even get to that part with Yaro. Customer support, research done for you. Find the best flights, hotels. If you're uh, like Eric Peterson, you want Airbnb, compile research reports, free you from social media, reply to your direct messages, comment on social posts and paid ads. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, delegate daily admin tasks, invoicing, data entry, CRM task management. This is amazing. So, um, Yaro, if nothing else, you got a new client for me. I'm very excited to get started. I'll come back and talk about my experience, but I am your target market for <laughs> sure because I'm going to break my addiction. I'm going to get rid of the rock and I'm going to live my best life. And actually, uh, we didn't get to the whole digital nomad thing. It become a digital nomad like you. Okay, fine. Let's just do we have a second. You have a minute? Yeah, yeah. All right. Of all the places you've been, if you could only live and work in one, which would you which would you pick and why? <laughs> Forever, like I have to stay in one place. Yep. Oof. I feel like the opposite question for a digital nomad. It's like this place is great, but there's no place that's great forever. Um, I mean, Hawaii will always you know, be the most natural, beauty, relaxing place to be. But there's actually not as strong a business community there, too. So sometimes, you know, if you want to have that life where you're actually intellectually stimulated with topics that you love and meeting people face to face... Uh, I mean, uh, Sydney is pretty awesome. I grew up in Australia and Sydney kind of gives you the, the beaches, but also the city. Um, but then Sydney is also very far away from everywhere else in the world. But if I'm stuck in one place, great weather, great food, great people, great business, probably Sydney, I would have to say it'd be the, one of the best places to be. I love Sydney. I lived there for uh, for three months in Coogee Beach. Oh, Coogee, uh, lovely. Coogee, yeah, great. Um, now I'm going to have to go get a Tim Tam. So, <laughs> well, thank you. Thank uh, you. And uh, I thought this was great. I just want to remind the listeners that the only way, the only way we're going to get quality guests like a Yaro Star Act from InboxDone.com is if you do three favors, follow, rate, review the podcast, send us a screenshot of your review, support at thelangic.com. We're going to send you for free a signed copy of Dirt Rich. All right. Are we ready to do this? One, two, three. Let's <laughs> Freedom, freedom, freedom ring. 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 <laughs> awesome. Thanks, John. Freedom rain. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Art of Passive Income podcast. Are you ready to learn how you can start building a passive income without renters, rehabs, renovations, or rodents? Schedule a free consultation at thelandgeek.com forward slash training. Let freedom ring.